Good evening again, everybody. This is Paul Woodad from World War II TV. We're doing the second part of our Operation Aquatint trilogy, although this time we're actually going to delve into the origins of Special Forces in the UK in 1940, 41, 42. And I've got one very special guest, uh, Damien Lewis, author of numerous books about um, Special Forces and, and commandos and all that. So thank you very much for joining us, Damien. Are you well tonight? Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Good to be here. And I have, you know him for those who follow World War II TV. This time he's got a tie on. It's um, uh, Duncan Hollands, who normally is doing the camera work, um, who's going to be adding to the conversation because you've got a particular connection with Aquitaine, isn't it, Duncan? Which is? Uh, my uncle Harry took part in Operation Aquitaine. So, so that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, well, and we'll touch, you know, we'll bring you in later on to talk about that. So um, for those who saw the first show, the first show we did Operation Aquitin from the uh, point of view of the German defenders in Normandy and how they reacted to what they didn't know was happening around them and lights and boats and, and gunfire and we did all that. And then we said at the end of that show we would come back and talk about how it all began and how it all uh, came out came to be. And that's why we came back with this show now. So it's, it's an interesting history, isn't it, Damien, how special forces sort of come to be. So you know, in 1940, the British Army is pretty much how it was in the 1920s and 30s. It's, you know, the divisional system. And then Churchill starts um, talking about different types of warfare. So explain how Churchill fits into this whole um, whole story. Yeah, so uh, basically 48 hours after um, Dunkirk, so June 1940, um, a, a chap called Lef uh, Colonel Dudley Clark who's a very underappreciated figure from World War II. People know him for deception operations, and he was a brilliant deceptionist. But, but actually, he came to Churchill 48 hours after, after Dunkirk and said, I went to General Alexander because he was, in his, he was in his, on his staff and said, I've got a proposal to form uh, the British commandos. And basically, Clark was brought up in South Africa. And Clark had seen the Boer commandos mm basically run rings around British forces. So 25,000, 50,000 Boer commandos, the Boer commandos rode their own horses, carried their own hunting weapons, dressed in South African farming gear, irregular bands of really guerrilla fighters. He'd seen them in operation as a child. He'd actually been at the siege of Ladysmith where they were besieged by the Boer commandos. And Clark, you know, his opinion of them was they were wonderful fighters and a brilliant way to wage warfare, tying down you know, hundreds of thousands of British troops. So we went to um, Alexander and said, look, I, 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 last night I came up with this one page idea for the British commandos. Anyway, that was put to Churchill. Churchill came back 24 hours later saying, you know, this has got my absolute blessing. Now, bear in mind, Churchill was also at the Boer War. He was there as a reporter and he was on an armoured train traveling through the country. The Boer commandos ambushed it. And in helping organize the defense, Churchill was, was captured and held as a prisoner by the Boer commandos. And he, 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 he made a absolutely epic escape and got away. So Churchill had also seen him in action and, and he gave it his absolute blessing. And he said to Clark, I want you to get a raid back across the channel to attack the Germans by the end of the month. So let's just think about that, all right? Because mm. that's very, very significant. That means having suffered cataclysmic defeat at Dunkirk, leaving tens of thousands of tanks, guns and, and, and weaponry behind on the beaches and, and, and many, many dead and captured Allied troops. Churchill has challenged Clark to take the offensive, attack the enemy with a completely unknown and unfounded means of waging warfare, at least as far as the British army was concerned. So Clark had uh, no trained men, he had no equipment and he had no recruits. But by the end of the month, which is what Churchill had asked for, he got 90 guys. So this was the inaugural commando, commando raid. And it was codenamed Operation Collar, fittingly. Let's collar the enemy. He got 90 commandos on RAF crash boats, which are inflatable dinghies, which you use to pluck down them and out of the sea. He got them across the channel. They raided a German outpost on, on, on the French coast. Uh, they, they, they caused casualties. They got all the men off alive. They evaded an e-boat and they got back to British shores. Now, was it significant? 
it wasn't going to win the war. And the greater schemes, I think, was it was an absolute pinprick. It was insignificant. But for the British people and our allies or our soon to be allies mm. in America, OK, this was crucial. The headlines the next day in the British papers were, you know, Operation Collar was fantastic. It proved we had the will to fight. And the headlines in America were, you know, the British bulldog finds its bite. So it had achieved exactly what Clark and Churchill set out to do. Neither of them believed that special operations, bear, bear in mind that the, the idea of special operations hadn't even been coalesced by then. But the idea behind these operations was not that they would win the war, but it was that they would prove we had the, the will and the audacity and the spirit and the means to hit back. And that was why it was absolutely key. Uh, so that was really the birth of modern day special forces. And it's a really, it's a really curious thing, but Churchill said, having, having seen the success of that first raid, I want 10,000 commandos by the end of the year, okay? Which was a hell of an ask. And you've got to bear in mind, he had enormous resistance for the military high command, the top brass, because, of course, they were in a defensive mindset. They were convinced Operation Sea Lion, the German invasion of Britain, was coming. They were convinced that we should roof in these islands and defend them at all cost. And their mindset was wholly defensive, which you can kind of understand. And of course, we were hopelessly sure of trained soldiers and war materiel. And here was Churchill saying, I want 10,000 commandos by the end of the year. I want them to be given all the equipment they need in this completely unproven form of warfare. Uh, and <laughs> it's extraordinary, but it's true. Clark was summoned before the, 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 the war cabinet and grudgingly they admitted that uh, Collar uh, you know, had been a success, uh, certainly a propaganda success. And they said, um, but you can't surely be intending to call this force the commandos. And Clark said, well, why have I not? And he, they said, because it has all the, you know, all the implications and reflects the original commandos in South Africa who were unruly. They, they didn't really follow their officers' orders. They didn't dress smartly. You know, this is not what the British Army do. And so Clark said, um, uh, what, what, what would you have them called? And, and what to recruit the, the volunteers for, for, for those first raids, they put out a call for what's called special service volunteers, okay? So you became a special service volunteer. And when Clark asked the war cabinet what they thought the commander should be called, they said, well, you should call them just the, the special service or SS for short. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so Clark went back to Churchill and said, I'm not uh, calling this force the SS and I don't think you'll want to either. Churchill put his foot down and hence the commanders were born. And, and that what's so fascinating about this, from my point of view, is, you know, well, and those are the those watching this is that, you know, you ask a modern kid to name elements of the British Army or the American military, they'll say Rangers and paratroopers and, and, and commandos and what's, you know, paratroopers. All this was new in 1940. All this hadn't been done. You know, the, the, army, the system was a, a, an old fashioned one. The people in charge of everything were 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 fight, refighting the World War One in a sense. So all this is absolutely revolutionary, and you can understand the resistance uh, against putting money into a to a new force. But obviously, it happened. So tell us, um, uh, Damien, how um, where these first people came from? Because it, uh, you're doing something a bit new. You're putting out a call for volunteers without really being able to say exactly what, you, what you're volunteering for. So where did the first um, batch of people come from? Well, they came from all, all walks of life. I mean, you had, um, you know, you had landed gentry to the manor born types down to, you know, street brawlers, brawlers from Wigan and everything in between. Um, you know, it was a very eclectic church. That's the great thing about, you know, telling stories from special forces from World War Two. You know, this really is a band of brothers. And, and the other thing that's utterly remarkable and is so true about the Second World War with elite forces, they were a meritocracy. It didn't matter where you were from. Once you were in that unit, merit was what counted. It was merit above rank. I mean, it was David Serling, I think, who said, we are a classless institution. And class really didn't count for anything. And rank, although obviously there was a command structure, yeah. you had to earn the respect of your fellow special operators to, to uh, 
you know, to take command and, and to be respected in the field. So you had a very broad church, like I say. I mean, those very first Operation Collar Commandos, there were some forces in Scotland who had been scheduled to go to Norway to deploy as part of the British Expeditionary Force there in the defence of Norway. Of course, the defence of Norway uh, didn't last very long. It was very gallantly fought by both the Norwegian forces and our own. But of course, they had nothing to do. So they were sat in Norway. And so actually, Clark's first recruiting mission wasn't putting out a notice at all. He actually got on the train, went to Scotland, and he, and he gave a presentation in front of those men who were sat around with nothing to do and said, you were trained for these kind of operations. Now you come, can come and do them for real. So that's where he got his first bunch of recruits. But, you know, to give you an idea of how utterly experimental this was, how utterly, you know, unfounded any of this was in, in any military history uh, or practice. So, and, and, you know, Churchill was an absolute visionary where special forces were concerned. And it's, it's no exaggeration to say that without his backing, they would not have happened and they would not have survived. He backed them to the hill all the way through the war against lots of opposition from mm. high command. Um, but Churchill had seen the German military's blitzkrieg use the Fulschenjäger, the their parachute troops yeah, yeah. and their glider-borne troops in, in operations around the Belgian forts when they had to circumvent the Maginot Line. So they yeah, dropped yeah. their airborne troops on the Belgian forts and took them by complete surprise. No one had ever seen airborne operations before. And Churchill had, had heard, you know, read the reports of those operations and was mightily impressed. And when Clark had proven that you know, the commandos as a concept uh, were well-founded, at least in Churchill's eyes, he said, I want 5,000 airborne commandos you know, by the end of the year as well. And Clark sat down to, you know, to scope out what, what, what the concept of the airborne commanders would do with his other commanders. And because they were special service volunteers, yeah, that's what they were officially called, that they put out calls for special service volunteers, Clark inserted the word air in between special service. And that's how you get special air service. That's where the name originated. Mm, and actually, yeah. Clark went to North Africa in, in, in autumn 41. He was then retasked to do deception operations, which he did then for most of the war. And he met Sterling in North Africa, David Sterling. And Sterling said to Clark, they became friends, and Sterling said to Clark, look, I'm thinking of founding this deep desert raiding operation to, to attack the enemy airfields, to try to you know, uh, relieve the pressure on our forces in North Africa and those besieged forces in Malta. And Clark said, great idea. He said, but if you're going to actually form a small force, why don't you base it upon something that's gone before? Because especially with the Italians, one of the greatest factors we have is the psychological factor you know if you can make them believe that this is the this is a force of of paratroopers who are you know long experienced in war bitter it'll strike the fear of god into them and one thing clark was doing um to that end is he was dropping dummy commandos in the desert by parachute where he knew the italians would see them the italian troops to make the italians believe we were dropping parachuters to put fear into them and he said to Sterling, if you adopt this name, Special Air Service, you know, and, and, the, spe and the Clark Special Air Service, their first mission was in Italy in 41, which itself is an amazing story. First ever airborne operation by Allied, Allied forces. But Clark said to Sterling, if you can adopt the SAS name and mantle, you know, that will give you so much more clout as far as the enemy is concerned. And that's where, where, where the whole legacy came from. So at the beginning, there's a, there's, it's as much about sending a message to the Germans as it, a, a psychological message as it is about actually physically going out and doing stuff. So which is fascinating. But we let's let's bring it to the because in the early years, there's there's lots of different forces. There's the long range desert group. Then there's the SAS. Eventually, you get yeah. the SBS. And there's the commandos and the Royal yeah. Marine commanders. Because let's let's talk about the small scale raiding force and exactly how they fit into the story because a lot of people won't really have heard of them because they did the end ultimately didn't have a particularly long history because they also changed right. so tell us tell us about about them then we'll ask duncan how his uncle got involved but we'll start with you damien so the small scale raiding force how did that yeah. how did that work so the small scale raiding force or srrf as they were they were kind of known as you say not a long history because eventually they were really subsumed into into the SAS, but small scale raiding force 
fairly uniquely in terms of special forces operations in World War II was distinguished by the fact they were under the command of the Special Operations Executive, mm. SOE. Now, SOE, as you know, was Churchill's Ministry for Ungentlemanly Warfare. So in a bit of explanation, even before the war, Churchill knew that when it came and he knew it was coming, uh, it was going to be a total war. That's the phrase he adopted, i.e. you would fight this war the same way as the Nazis were fighting it, no holds barred. And unless you did that, you were not going to win. And so he wanted an organisation that could do just that, fight the war, no holds barred. And that means breaking all the rules. And he set up SOE to do that. It, it was officially called the, minist uh, the, the, the Ministry for Economic Warfare, got the nickname, the Ministry for Ungentlemanly Warfare. And basically, SOE's mandate was to go out and carry out assassinations, sabotage, raising guerrilla armies, raising terrorist forces, all those things you're not really supposed to do. So as an example, um, you know, SOE organized and trained the, 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 the Czechs who carried out the raid, uh, sorry, the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich in, in, in Prague. That's the yeah. kind of thing they specialized in. And so when, S when the special, small scale raiding force was raised, it was raised under SOE to do the kind of raids that you really perhaps weren't supposed to do, ones that could be denied if it was necessary. So one of the first operations was, was Postmaster, where they raided the, um, uh, the, the islands off the West African coast of Fernando Po. Now, bear in mind, classic, classic small scale raiding force operation, uh, classic SOE operation, because they, 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 they sailed from the UK in a what's called a Q ship. So it's a trawler to all intents and purposes, but it's actually bristling with hidden weaponry. And they sailed in that to West Africa. And from there, they launched the raid on the, on the harbors of Fernando Po, where they knew there were German ships moored, which were suspected of being uh, uh, refueling and, and, and repair points for German U-boats, which were causing havoc off the West African coast. Why was that? Why, why did that have to be a deniable operation? Because Fernando Po was Spanish, colonial Spanish territory, and therefore it was a neutral country, mm, mm. neutral territory. Carrying out what's basically piracy, stealing ships from a neutral territory, yeah? When Spain's not in the war, but if it does enter the war, it's gonna be on the, Nazi, the side of Nazi Germany. You can imagine the stakes of that operation. You yeah. couldn't get higher stakes. That's why it had to be deniable, because if they were caught and if they were found out, Churchill had to be able to say they're nothing to do with us. They're dressed in civilian clothing. Um, you know, we knew nothing about it. It wasn't on our orders. And that's exactly what SOE was set up to do. And the small scale raiding force was, if you like, the offensive arm of SOE. So, um, Duncan, how did your great uncle get involved in this caper right at the beginning? Or, right. And I'll just show a photo of, of Duncan passing out at the at, at guards depot. So what, what year was that, Duncan? That was uh, 81. And on the right there is, the, is your uncle. Yeah, there we go. So tell us about him. Okay, so basically, um, uh, Lieutenant Freddie Bourne was given the command of MTB 344, nicknamed Little Pisser. Now, she was a very small MTB. She was only 60 feet long. And uh, there she is there. And basically, because she was short, she could get up onto the plane very quickly. She had twin um, twin engines. She had a, a capable of 40 knots, 47 mile an hour when she got up onto the plane. She was exceptionally well armed. She had two torpedo tubes. She had Vickers machine guns on the side of the bridge. She also had two Lewis um, guns aft at the crew quarters. So she was heavily set up. And... Uh, Freddie took command of her. Um, I will tell you that prior to when he joined the Navy, he went to the Fleet Air, or, uh, Fleet Air Arm, and un unfortunately, he, uh, he, uh, he crashed an aircraft. So um, he started looking uh, of changing his um, outlook on what he could do in the, in the Navy and went into general service. And eventually, he ended up in a roundabout way going into the, uh, the motor torpedo flotilla. Once he had done his, uh, his courses and he'd done his general seaman stuff and he went up and did uh, torpedo courses up in Fort William, Scotland, he was given the command of motor torpedo vessel uh, 344. 
Now, when he got it, um, he was told by uh, Roger Thornycroft, who was uh, making these boats, that the army were looking at it. And did he mind? As it turned out, small-scale raiding force were looking at these vessels and sort of had them penciled into their plans. So he was asked, would he come under the small-scale raiding force, which he didn't have a problem with. He had been playing with um, A-boats in the past and naval intelligence, so it wasn't a problem for him. And he went down to a place called um, Anderson Manor, just on the outskirts of Beer Regis in Dorset. And he met Major Gus, uh, Gus March Phillips, who was in command of Small Scale Raiding Force, and Captain Jeffrey Appleyard, who was a 2IC down at Anderson Manor. And he was outlined, he was told roughly what was going on, how they were going to do these little missions. And subsequently, they started putting these, these missions together, and they were being very successful. So okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you there for a minute, Duncan. I'll bring you back in and get a, a, in a in a minute. And um, so, so da Damien, is that is that typical of how um, uh, these people got involved? Just you know, someone just turned up and said, you know, we've got this thing. Um, we'd like you know, we'd like to get you involved. Is that is that typical? Yeah, I mean, you know, SOE, which was the, you know the the umbrella organisation for the small scale raiding force. Um, they were known as the Tweed Cat Boys. No offence, you've, you've got one on yourself, I see. Uh, and um, they were known as the Tweed Cat Boys because it was an old boys club. And basically, yeah. you could only get in. Uh, you, you know, the SOE couldn't advertise for membership because it was a top secret, deniable or organisation. It's obvious you could. So they had to recruit by the old boys network. And that's what they did. Um, there's a fantastic story. Um, it, it's, it's in SAS Italian Job, my book, about Mike Lease, who was... You know, he's from a he's from a very, very well connected landed gentry Dorset family. But, you know, when he heard about the Tweed Cat Boys, when he realized there was room for him and the enemy in Europe and he could go and fight them in person, he wanted in. But even he didn't have the connections. So he had to blag his way in. He he basically got one of the Tweed Cat Boys drunk in a bar, found out all his biographic details, realized he was going on holiday, walked into the SOE office and said, um, you know, Sebastian's my old school pal and had knew so much about him. Yes, so he believed him. That's how he got in. So, yeah, it was generally, you know, the, the handshake and the nod and, and getting invited in by, by someone you know. I guess there were exceptions, you know, Lassen, Anders Lassen, yeah. um, you know, who, who, was the, who is the only member of the British SAS to have ever won the Victoria Cross. Not British, obviously he's Danish, but he was in the British SAS. Yeah. You know, Lassen himself was recruited into... The small scale raiding force and of course he didn't have those connections coming from Denmark in fact he arrived in Britain having you know having basically stowed away on, on, on having been a merchant sailor so Lassen was was invited in but because you know people rec the, the recruiting office recognized him these absolutely extraordinary uncanny abilities you know the fact he used to hunt you know for deer on his father's state with a bow and arrow and that he was he was proposing a bow and arrow as a means of silent killing during the war. This is exactly the kind of person they wanted. So there were exceptions, but largely you were recruited uh, by who you knew. And, you know, did it work? Um, yeah, you can argue it did. You know, what other means did they have? You, you, obviously you couldn't, you couldn't advertise for or, um, or, or go talking widely about an organisation which didn't exist was mm. deniable. They had no other option, I guess. And I suppose at the beginning, they, don't, they didn't even quite know what they wanted either, because, because the ideas were in some ways going to come from the people they recruited, because Churchill was saying, we want to do these raids. Someone's got to put these things together. So how you can do it and what you're going to do is going to be all, all influenced by the kind of people you bring in and say, well, we could do this with this type of boat. We could do this with this type of aircraft. And so it's a, it's a, sort of a, a combination of different skills. So um, yeah, we, Duncan mentioned... Um, March Phillips there. So I think yeah. we ought to bring him in because he's one of the characters in, 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 in several of your books. And so um, where, where does he come into the story and who, who exactly was he? I'll put his photo up. Yeah. So, so March Phillips was, was, you know, a typical um, uh, small scale raiding force uh, SOE recruit. I mean, you know, you, these very early recruits in, into SOE and, 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 and small scale raiding force, it's fascinating when, when you go and dig around in the archives and get the original, original documents, they were given double O numbers. 
So March Phillips would have been like 0016 or 008. And the 00 was actually, you know, we think of it from James Bond. Well, Bond yeah. stole it from, sorry, uh, you know, the author of Bond stole it from, from the reality, from the SOE. And SOE gave people 00 orders, which meant you were licensed to basically kill in any means necessary, uh, you know, and, 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 and with no, uh, no accountability to the law. That's what they were told. So you really did need very particular individuals. And it wasn't for most people. You know, if you were squeamish about murder and assassinations and stealing and, 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 and disguise and theft uh, and bluff, all those things which perhaps don't come naturally to all of us, uh, this was not the kind of place for you. But, you know, it really did get under, under the skin of, of the enemy. And, you know, it, one of the fascinating things about these, these operations and these early operations is that Hitler in particular got it into his head that they were an insult against the Reich and him personally and all his senior commanders. So mm. he reacted very, 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 he overreacted against these raids because he believed they were personally an insult towards him. Now, if that's what was intended and, you know, Part of me, I've never found a document saying it, but part of me can't, can't, cannot but believe that Churchill would have loved that effect. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's exactly the kind of thing Churchill would have thrilled to, getting under Hitler's skin. Well, these things really did deliver on that point. So going back to what you said earlier, they were very much a psychological operation against the enemy. Bear in mind, the Germans said of, of the SS sports girl raiding force, uh, they come like cats in the night, i.e. we don't see them arrive, we don't see them leave. There's just a load of dead Ger you know, fellow German soldiers and a load taken prisoner. Just imagine how terrifying that must have been. You know, Churchill had exhorted them. He said, no German soldier should be allowed to sleep soundly in their bed at night. That's what he said when he wanted these forces mm. raised. That's how the enemy reacted. So, you know, as a psychological operation, it was extremely effective. But you've also got to bear in mind, right in the earlier stages, it was a psychological operation for us as well. Absolutely, yeah. We had yeah. to prove we had the spirit and the audacity to fight back. And at that moment, post Dunkirk, when Hitler wanted a peace deal, he wanted us to sue for peace. He wanted, and he did not want to fight Britain. Hitler wanted to turn all his attention to the Eastern Front. That's what he really wanted. He didn't want a fight with us. He wanted Churchill removed from power and he wanted a peace deal. And at that moment, to show in a demonstrable, concrete, aggressive, bloody way, no, we have the means to fight back and we will, was absolutely key to the British people and the British nation. It's key, but it's also at that point, frankly, our only option. We can't, we can't start thinking about invading France and Europe again. Yeah, we haven't got an army. So if we're going to do anything, it has to be small scale and 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 on the level of something commander because there's nothing else open to us. So, the small scale raiding force. What 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 were their first few missions like, and what were they trying to do, and how did the first ones go, Damon? And we'll bring Duncan as well. But how how did the first ones go? Well, one of the very first, like I say, was was Operation Postmaster. This yeah. this was a, a you know it was one of the earliest of the lot, and it was so um, incredibly ambitious. Nothing had been tried like it before. And the stakes, I mean, the stakes were you you could you could argue that it shouldn't have been attempted because, as I say, you know we were we were attacking German, we were stealing, you know it was piracy. They went in there, they cut the anchor chains, overcame the crew, and stole away three German vessels from. A, a Spanish port and Spain was a neutral party in the war. So, mm. you know, Churchill and, and all, those few commanders in the new, in the know, knew exactly what the stakes were. You could argue it was a crazy thing to do because it could have provoked and it would have provoked Spain into, um, into joining the war. When, you know, the, the, the port authorities realized these ships had been stolen, of course, they had no idea who, who would carried out this audacious and piratical mission, okay? But of course they suspected, you know, uh, they suspected the, en the, the enemy, they suspected us. And what we were able to go back and say was, yes, we have these three vessels, but we found them adrift in international waters. 
<laughs> and, under, and under international law, they're fair game. So we've taken them, thank you very much. That's plausible deniability. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what this was set up to achieve. It was set up to enable things like that to be possible and to get away with it. But it, 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 it just reinforces the idea that you need people who are doing this, who you said it yourself. They've got to be thinking unconventionally because... They, they, Typical British Army officers. This this breaks the rules. Everything you've been trained to do, you know, and you're you're having to be, you having to cheat. You're 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 cheating cheating the Germans. You're not you're not taking them on fairly. You're you so it's it's an extraordinary concept. So, let's 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 bring it up towards um, the forty two era and when we're going to lead the lead the events leading up to Operation Aquatim, which is after all the kind of the focus of this show. So, there have been some operations early in Sark. Tell us about the ones in Sark and how they'd gone and what and and, and I'll bring Duncan as well for this. But um, if you start off, Damon, then I'll bring Duncan in particularly about what his, his uncle was involved in. But the, um, sure. let's talk about the, the the Channel Islands. Yeah. So there was there was some small scale raiding force raids on the Channel Islands. Um, you know, and th these these you could well they did go very well. However. Um, there was there was a uh, this was the start of Hitler deciding that these raids were personally directed at him and these were war crimes. That's that's mm. what he, he accused us of, because during the raid on, on Sark, uh, which was largely led by Anders Lassen, Lassen was this Danish nobleman who had spent his you know, youth um, hunting deer with a bow and arrow on the estate and and and, and was was wild at heart. You know, uh, many people have accused Lassen of being a psychopath. Um, I don't believe that myself. If you actually look through all the records, he, one of the things he cared about most intensely on all his operations was the locals. I mean, there's one operation I write about, sorry, I'm digressing, but there's one operation I write, I write about in, um, in, in the Mediterranean where they go and raid an island, okay, and he writes a note which he sends to the German commander before leaving, and the note says, if you carry out one single reprisal, against one single villager on this island, we will come back personally and kill you all. So that's how much Lassen cared about the, the local people under his watch. But the raids on Sark, that, 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 the particular raid on Sark that was led by Lassen, they took some Germans prisoner. And often these raids, what they were intending to do was to take prisoners and to gather intelligence. You bring them back to the UK, you, know, you, you, you interrogate them and you find out more about German intentions, et cetera, uh, and also to gather documents. So they had some German prisoners and they had them, they had them tied up, taking them down to the beach. And there was a fight and, 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 and several of them escaped. And in, in, in the melee that followed, the, the raiders shot some of these German soldiers. OK, so come come dawn, the German troops find these German soldiers dead with their hands tied. So the report goes out in the German press, you know, British um, you know, pirates land on, on the Channel Islands and um, tie up, you know, German soldiers and execute them in cold blood. It's not what happened. But that was the word that went out. Hitler's ap apoplectic with rage. And that's where he starts his vendetta against um, all special forces. And that really is the birth of what became his notorious commando order. So the commando order was authored not long after by Hitler. Um, and it basically said, it, you know, it, I paraphrase, but it's words to the effect of all uh, commandos and parachute troops, whether captured in uniform or out of uniform, if captured behind the line, shall be given no quarter and are to be executed out of hand. You can only keep them alive for as long enough as the Gestapo and SS need them to be alive for interrogation purposes, uh, uh, after which they will be killed outright. Any German commander who disobeys this order will be called before the high command to answer for his acts. So that meant any uh, small scale raiding force, commandos, SAS, SBS, paratroopers dropped behind the lines, yep. captured by the enemy, was on a death sentence. And bear in mind, these guys were deploying in uniform. There is nothing in the laws of war against behind the lines operations. In fact, the Germans launched behind the line operations at the start of the war and they actually, actually got a legal opinion drawn up by their own lawyers saying behind the lines operations are perfectly legal under the rules of war. So these men that Hitler was, was, was sentencing to death, and bear in mind, not just death, but torture and yeah, horrendous yeah, treatment yeah. by the Gestapo beforehand, they were deploying in uniform uh, behind the lines, carrying out operations 
you know, uh, uh, complying with all the laws of war. So this was murder, pure and simple. And it was the raid on Sark, which pretty much kicked off uh, Hitler's concept that uh, these, these raids were uh, war crimes and, uh, you know, it, they were directed personally against him and his high command and he needed to do something about it. That was the birth of the commando order. So one, of the, of a, one of the most of notorious, point, yeah, one of the most notorious, um, you know, developments of the war, you know, it wasn't, and it wasn't just, bear in mind, it wasn't just, it was also SOE agents. So all those agents dropped behind enemy lines. Okay. Now they were dropped in civilian clothes. They weren't dropped in uniform, but even, even if they were seized and arrested and held as spies, even a spy under the laws of war, and under international law must be given a fair trial. Okay. Yeah. There was none of these, none of these uh, captured agents were given a trial and bear in mind in, in Britain, when we captured German agents. So the other way around, when they dropped people on our soil and they were in, in civilian clothes, we gave them a trial. And in the trial, we said, you know, or, or, or even before the trial, we said, you've got two choices. You can stand trial and you might, you might be um, sentenced to death or, you can come and work, work for us. That was the double cross system. Uh, but that is complying with the laws of war. And it's what following the raid on Sark and one or two other raids that came shortly thereafter. That's what Hitler expressly denied under his commando order. Yeah. So th this is a turning point, really. So, Duncan, I'm going to bring you in again now. So um, when you're... Um, your um, great uncle was involved in this and he gets part of the MTB crew. Um, tell me, when was he involved in the Sark raid? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was um, basically what happened. Well, let me explain. Basically what happened, um, 2nd and 3rd of September, 42, the Caskets Lighthouse uh, raid, 12-man uh, team. Uh, they managed to successfully capture seven Germans. Three were sleeping, two had just turned in. Two were on duty, and the German soldier in charge actually fainted. Some of these German soldiers were actually captured with hairnets and their pajamas on. But anyway, as Appleyard and um, March Phillips, uh, Anders Larsen, and um, Sergeant Godfrey Spencer were getting these guys onto onto the MTB, um, unfortunately, um, Appleyard slipped on the rocks and he broke his tibia. And I think it was a wake-up call for him because he realised that um, when men were killed and injured, um, he needed other people to, to step into the breach, so to speak. So Appleyard was an exceptional navigator. He was first class. And he decided to bring in a Belgian commando on the team called Rick Van Rill. And he was given the task... That's Appleyard there. As, yeah, as a second navigator um a standby and when he came on board another decision was made that there should be more navigators everyone had to do each other's jobs now my uncle harry was up at bovington which is just literally down the road from beer regis and he was a nautical man he was um in the uh, the tank corps but if you put a hatch down on a tank no matter where he was he seemed to find his way around the battlefield and around the training area and he had a. So you've a lost homing... your image there for a minute, Duncan. Your bandwidth is low. We've lost your image. You've disappeared. But well, um, we can still hear you. But okay, oh, now you're back now. Okay. So um, he had an interview at Anderson Manor, and he was given a uh, a job of an assistant assistant navigator, and his first outing happened to be Operation Aquatint. And speaking to him, he remembers the operation, you know, exceptionally well. It's something that stuck in his mind right up until he passed away in 1991. He said, you know, first time on a boat, we were down, down below navigating. Um, Apple Yard was there just keeping an eye on us. Um, they came in, they went down onto the auxiliary engines and they coasted. And they, he says they were about a quarter of a mile offshore. They dropped the anchor, the dory went out with the guys on board, and he said within a matter of minutes, he said, flares, searchlight. He said it was actually a white flare, not a red flare, as in the German record. And 
a decision was made by Appleyard to um, to get out of there. He said, there's no way these guys are going to survive it. So they, they cut the anchor ropes and um, they made it back to Portland um, under the cover of darkness, uh, trying to avoid any um, e-boats being alerted and coming out of um, Sherbrooke. But uh, from what he told me, uh, they carried out in total 17 operations. And the last operation was um, uh, Portland to St. Peter's Port uh, in Guernsey between the 7th and the 14th of January, 44. Um, unfortunately, the weather affected the operations. Um, they were tasked to go there and put limpet mines on ships in the harbour. So yeah, that was his little story. Well, and, and he said it's fascinating because he, your uncle doesn't appear in most of the books. And that, and that suggests no, that he, 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 was just, were, he was just brought in at the 12th hour. Last minute, the yeah. Convenient. Um, to be honest with you, I, I think that uh, I think he did two operations. He never spoke much about it. I think he just did the two and um, he stepped back into general service. So, well, thanks for that, Duncan. And I mean, and obviously in our first show that the, the, this Aquatint trilogy, we explained the events on the on the beach itself. So we're not going to go through that again. And neither are we going to go through exactly what happened to the survivors of the Aquatint raid, because we're going to do that in a third part of this. Uh, but we're going to bring it back to the, the repercussions in terms of how the history of the small scale raiding force and commandos go. And that's why we're going to bring it back to Damon again now, because... There's, we, you know, suffice it to say, our Operation Aquatint, which was September '42, was a disaster. I mean, it it it, it couldn't really have gone more more badly wrong. So, what were the repercussions back at uh, in the UK with regards to how these raids were going? It must have caused a, a you know big shockwaves. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, they lost pretty much all the guys, and and more important, they lost Gus March Phillips, who. It was the, you know, the, really the founder of the small scale raiding force and, and the inspiration behind it. I mean, you know, I, I can remember reading Lassen's accounts. Um, so Anders Lassen was, was scheduled to go on the mission. And at the last moment, uh, he was unable to go. I, I think he was ill at the time. And so he was waiting back in the UK for the men to return, expecting them to come back, as from many previous raids with German prisoners and with tales of daring do. And in fact, you know, the, the MTB, little pisser came back, uh, but none of the none of the raiders. And, you know, they were all presumed, uh, you know, killed on, on the raid. But most 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 tellingly of all, um, Lassen was devastated by the loss of Gus March Phillips. But in terms of the wider ramifications of it, that was pretty much the end of the small scale raiding force. And, you know, the um, the, the, the survivors from that unit really were then um, subsumed, I guess you would say, under either the SAS or uh, back into the commandos. And, and, and then really a rump of them, Lassen included, went on. And I suppose this is where the, the, the through flow, this is the legacy, if you like. A rump of them, Lassen first and foremost, went then to form the, the Special Boat Squadron. Of course, it wasn't, it wasn't called the SBS to start with, the Special Boat Squadron. So what happened was, you know, fairly early on during the birth of the SAS in North Africa, uh, you know, they realized they needed a, a waterborne contingent. And of course, that was the that was the genesis of the small scale raiding ra raiding force. And so those guys went on to form the special boat squadron, um, you know, uh, and whilst they were away from the UK. So by that, I mean, you've got to bear in mind when when the guys from the school scale, small scale raiding force fly out to North Africa to join the SAS and then fought, found the SBS, they are they're, they're a long way away from the UK and their operations are. <laughs> I mean, they are utterly piratical. And, and they make no excuses for that. And indeed, you know, Churchill makes no excuses for that. In fact, that's exactly what he's called for. He's called mm. for them to spread terror amongst the enemy. And they're doing a very good job all the way across North Africa, across all those airfields across North Africa with the SAS and across all those islands and, 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 and German bases uh, and Italian bases in the Mediterranean. They are doing an extremely good job of spreading havoc and chaos and most importantly, terror in the hearts of the enemy. I, I mentioned earlier that quote, yeah. they come and go like cats in the night. Uh, this was fearful stuff. 
There weren't very many of them, but that's what special operations forces do. They're called a force multiplier. Yeah. So you, yeah. Only need, you only need a small band of specialist maverick raiders to tie down and strike fear into a much larger group. I mean, I digress again, and I'm jumping forward, but, you know, um, to, in France, in behind the lines operations, and, and earlier, in fact, in Italy and even in North Africa, you know, the SAS on land had deliberately adopted a policy, and they called it cutting the head off the Nazi snake. So it's very simple. You see a column of vehicles coming along a road, a German military convoy, okay? Maybe there's 50 trucks crammed full of soldiers. You do not attack the trucks. You wait for the staff car. And when there's three staff cars, you, you've got particularly lucky, and you wait till they're all in front of your jeep-mounted machine guns, and then you open fire, you destroy the staff cars, you kill all the occupants, and then... That's, that's the shoot part of the attack, and then you do the scoot. It's a hit and run operation, and you get away. You don't bother with the soldiers because if you kill the, the commanders, if you kill the officers, what's the average soldier going to think? They're going to think, not even Colonel so and so, or General so and so, or Captain so and so is safe from these British raiders that we never see that come like and go like cats in the night. Nothing strikes fear more into your rank and file than taking out the senior commanders. And that was an avowed policy of the SAS through the war. So, so, you know, these operations were, you know, take no prisoner, very closely targeted, but, but, but piratical in the extreme. Um, you know, and, and it only really starts to become slightly more regularized. And by regularized, I mean more of the paying attention to dress, uniform, saluting, all the kind of things that the military is more renowned for, when all those forces are called back to the UK. And they're called back to the UK kind of end 43, early 44. And why are they called back to the UK? Well, they're called back uh, for preparations for D-Day because those same forces are then going to deploy behind the lines in, in France, um, you know, in, in support of the D-Day landings. And again, spread havoc and chaos behind the lines, which is exactly what they do. But they come back to the UK and they are this, they are this war-bitten, highly decorated, piratical band of raiders who, who, you know, many of them have been, let's think, you know, if you're a small-scale raiding force veteran, you know, or one of the early op-collar veterans, you've been on raiding operations for, you know, three or four years back to back. Some mm. of these guys were doing multi-operations a week. You know, Sterling said, you know, my ideal unit of raiders is four strong. Why? Because one, the bonds forged between those men will be unbreakable because there are so few of them. Secondly, they can get in and out without being noticed. But thirdly, most importantly of all, if you've got an 80 strong force and you've got bands of four, you can imagine how many operations you can mount in one night just with 80 soldiers. Do you understand? Yeah. That's why they're a force multiplier. And, you know, it, it very successful, it proved, but it's, it's anathema to the British high command. They come back to the UK. You know, th there are not only white Russians and Spanish Civil War veterans and French foreign legionnaires and, and every other nationality you can imagine within the ranks of the SAS. There's, a, there's, there's a lot of Germans and the Germans basically so that largely they're German Jews, Austrian Jews. OK, they fled the Holocaust. They've seen their families suffer unspeakably okay and they were recruited mostly in north africa within palestine then a british protectorate and, and they initially a lot of them formed um a, a specific german speaking unit to carry out raids behind the lines posing yeah. as german soldiers it's another story but eventually they too are subsumed into the ss so, so you know this 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 outfit comes back to the uk with with not only not a great deal of, of, of rigid military spit and polish and discipline, but, you know, a polyglot army speaking lots of different languages. A lot of them don't even have papers, OK? And it doesn't particularly go down too well. And that's when you start to get, you know, a sense of regimented control being, being um, superimposed. And, of course, by now, if we're talking about the SAS, David Sterling has been captured. Yeah, he's, he's in cold, it's, isn't he's he? In yeah, cold, so he's it's, gone. Phillips so, is, Mark so, Phillips is dead. Mark Phillips is dead. So uh, Lassen, you know, 
soon to be <laughs> soon to be um, on, on operations in Italy. So you've got really it's Paddy, uh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel um, Blair Main in charge, you know, DSO twice by now, a absolutely towering individual. He's the man who commanded the SS through the war. Let's face it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And Lassen, highly decorated, a former Irish and British Lions rugby international, a trained lawyer. You can imagine six foot, you know, two, six foot three, mm. a, you know, an absolutely, well, you imagine, you know, and, and someone's going to have to stand up to Maine and say, uh, well, you know, those sandy berries that you wear with the SS badge, you can't wear those anymore. You now have to wear the, the regular red maroon beret of, of all airborne troops. Fantastic berry to wear, of course, you know, iconic, you know, earned, earned British paratroopers, you know, rightly the you know the uh, german um moniker of the red devils because they were so yeah, fierce yeah. in battle great when you're doing frontline operations not brilliant when you're 500 miles behind the lines you've got to blend in a red berry doesn't really cut the mustard no and and, and not only that you know the sandy berry was you know it, why was it that color it's obvious because it was a, for desert operations you know it was mm. it was close to their heart so it's when they return to the uk that they really start to face um being squeezed into a more regimented um, and controlled environment. And, you know, I firmly believe that had it not been for Churchill and, and a few other, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, Mount Batten among others, mm. I, uh, you know, they would have been done away with. They would have been done away with shortly after their return to the UK. You know, they were great. These men were brilliant in extremis in times of war when you're really on your back foot and reeling. But when you start to win, and when you start, when it's all about pitch battles, there was there, there were a lot of very powerful individuals who didn't want them around anymore. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and and thank God they didn't get their way, and thank God they survived until the end of the war and to this day. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that. It's that I remember someone telling me about some American Rangers. I mean, you want you want them. People like that, you want them behind glass, sort of, if in an emergency, break glass, let them out. But you don't yeah. necessarily want them living next door to you. And that's a, you know, a subject we could come we could discuss in a future uh, show. But I want to bring you in, Dame, to talk about the, um, you know, in all your study, and we'll let, we'll let you talk about your latest book in a minute. But in your study, do people like Lassen and, and the other guys and, and Blair Main, was there an, obviously an emotional toll on them? You know, because after three, you said it yourself a minute ago, three or four years of combat operations, you've seen some of your best mates been killed. Others have been captured. You, I mean, we, we won't go in. We'll do that in the third show. People like Graham Hayes, you know, and Apple Yard gets killed and Sissy Hayes gets killed by the Gestapo in Paris. You, 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 what's happening to these guys on a, on a pure psychological level? I mean, are, are, do, do you yeah. read between the lines and are they having breakdowns? What's happening you, to them? You don't have to read between the lines and it's a very good question. And of course, it res that, that question will resonate with lots of veterans today. You know, yeah. and if there are veterans out there watching, I'm sure it does. So yeah, you, you've got to think about it. Four years of back to back behind the lines operations, you know, not only have you lost some of your closest, closest friends you will ever know, but you also know, because, you know, by 44, by summer 44, the commando orders pretty much proven. I mean, what happened was um, a, an SAS trooper called Hughes was captured in Italy in 43 um, and the Gestapo interrogated him and said, no, 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 you, you're not, you don't get any protections under the Geneva Convention. Because you're a commando and a paratrooper, you are subjected to the commando order and you're going to be interrogated and shot out of hand. Hughes managed to escape, got back to the UK, wrote a report on, on, on this, this Hitler commando order. And luckily that got into the hands of the SS and it was taken very seriously. So by summer 44, you know, that even the missing in actions from any mission are, are very likely to face really horrific torture. I mean, you know, really horrific torture and then murder. OK, you know, that's happening. So what effect does it has? Well, easier to talk specifics. So um, I think 2014, I wrote a book called The Nazi Hunters. It's about Operation Leuton um, in, in the in, in, book. It, yeah, mm. in, in, in France. And um, so the, the, the advanced party of Operation Leuton, 12 men fl from the SAS flying in to, to parachute into, in, into the mountains to, to, to link up with the resistance and, and, and get the rest of the guys in. Anyway, the point is, the night they are deploying, um, 
Captain Henry Druce, amazing figure from the Second World War. Look him up, Google him, Captain Henry Druce. Utterly unbelievable figure. Anyway, Henry Druce gets a call in his barracks and it's from uh, Colonel Franks, who was the commander of two SAS. And he's, Colonel Franks said, I need you here now. You've got to take over uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the advanced party of Operation Loyton. Druce had never trained with these men, didn't even know their names. Gets on a train, goes down to the, to the forward mounting base where they're flying out from. And this is what's happened. The commander who's trained with those men to deploy and has fought all through the war, okay, has what they, and this is how they turned it, he's crapped out. So he's gone to Colonel Franks hours before L hour, liftoff hour, and he's literally gone into his office and said, sir, I can't go. I've lost my nerve. Now, as Drews himself said, that was the bravest thing to have done. Yeah, yeah. Why was it the bravest thing to have done? Because, bugger me, forgive my English, but imagine having the guts to do that. And not, most importantly of all, having the guts to do that before you deploy. Because if you deploy and you crap out on the ground, not only are your 12 men without a leader, without an effective leader, but they've then got to look after you. So what that, what, what that you know, captain in charge of the advance op Operation Loyton Advance Force did was an extremely brave thing to do. And it was well known. The phrase was crapping out. Yes, people's nerve was going all the time, of course. But that's, not, that's, that's you know, really not the, 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 the major impact. The major impact is, is the aftermath. What happens when the war's over? What happened to a man like Paddy Maine? You know, um, Maine died an early death. You know, I've, I've been to the place where he died in a road accident late at night. He'd been drinking. You know, these guys, a lot of them, it, it's obvious they came back with what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. There was no diagnosis. There was no talk about it at the time. There was no help on offer. And like you said, these were men best kept in a steel cage and only let out at times of war. And so when the war was over, no one really wanted to know anymore. And bear in mind, think about it, okay? You've been there, you've seen guys crap out, you've seen guys killed terribly under the commando order, your best friend, you'll never might make friends like that again. And then come October 1945, those in high places finally get their way and the SAS and the SBS and all special forces are disbanded, got rid mm. of and mm. told to destroy all their papers and all their records. Imagine how that felt. Yeah, well, I can't really. I mean, it's just, it's, it's devastating stuff. So just briefly, Duncan, with your, with your great uncle, because obviously you said he only did a couple of operations, but when you spoke to him later on and he was able to look at um, uh, what happened to some of the men he'd been with, did he have any sort of survivor's guilt to the fact that men he'd been with had such horrific endings? Was that something you ever talk about? Um, basically, he said to me that um, he said to see, you know, Captain Appleyard, um, you know, have his put his hands, you know, his head into his hands and, you know, shed a tear. He said it uh, it changed everything. He said for for days after Dana Anderson Manor, it just, it, you know, the, the, the mood just changed, you know, um, it had been cancelled, Aquaton had been cancelled the day before, so there'd been girlfriends around, mm. stuff like that. And the mood completely changed. And he said, I will never, ever forget, you know, when he made that order to uh, cut the line of the anchor and then put the uh, auxiliary engine into reverse and then pull away from what's now become known as Omaha Beach. Yeah, but as, as an elderly uh, man, when he'd had time to look back on it, with you know, was, was that, did, it, did, he get, did he change as he got older? Yeah, I think it. I think he did. Yeah, I think he. Um, I think he did. He he changed dramatically. I think uh, he became a lot softer. Um, he forgave people more. I think he lived for the day. He realised just how lucky he'd been, you know, to actually have made that mission and made it safely back to Portland. Yeah, definitely, yeah. without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Well, the, I mean, I haven't met many commando versions, but the ones I did, I think they, they've all realized that they got away by the skin of their teeth and that they were very, well, all, all men who survive a war are lucky to have survived the war, particularly the risks they're facing. So we'll, we'll wrap things up fairly shortly, but I think we ought to get a chance to talk about your, your latest book, Damien, and the one that's this next month, isn't it? So tell us a little bit about that so that our viewers can understand what, where, where to get it and what it's about. Yeah, so it's called SAS Band of Brothers, um, and it's basically the story of a of a twelve man patrol who parachute behind the lines in France in the immediate aftermath of D Day. Their mission, as as many SAS uh, had the same mission across France, is to attack, ambush, and destroy the German heavy armour, which has been moved up from the south in an effort to drive the Allies off the D Day beaches and back into the sea. So it's a crucial mission. And it's, and it's a typical SAS tasking. Um, they spread havoc and mayhem quite spectacularly. Uh, they execute the most daring escape I've ever heard of in France. But finally, they're betrayed. Um, and and the, the, the method of their betrayal is also an incredible story. And they're captured by the SS and the Gestapo, taken to the Avenue Foch in Paris, 84 Avenue Foch, which was the Gestapo headquarters, interrogated, tortured. And then Hitler finds out about it. And on his personal orders, going back to what I was saying earlier, again, another example, you know, it, it, Hitler is personally insulted by these operations. So he finds out there have been the, there's been this SAS patrol captured. And on his personal orders, they're to be dressed in civilian clothes, driven out to a Paris woodland and murdered. OK, so that murder, murder mission goes ahead. Uh, in August 44, but two of the men escape. And, and the means of their escape is, is, is quite remarkable in itself. They link up with the French resistance. They fight with the French resistance for several months. And then at the end of the war, having soldiered through to war's end with the SAS, they join up with the SAS war crimes, investiga get war crimes investigation team, what became known as the secret hunters. So the unit, which after the disbandment of the SAS carries on anyway, hunting war criminals for three years at the end of the war as a completely deniable black operation. Yeah, it's the, the most amazing story. And anyway, these two individuals join up with the SAS war crimes investigation team to hunt down the killers. And in the summer of 1947, they get them into the courts and justice is finally done. So it's one of those really unbelievably um, moving, gripping, dramatic, poignant uh, stories cradled to the grave, you know? Um, and I've had so much help from the sons and the daughters of those who are on the mission um, and, and the sons and the daughters of the, of, of, of the SAS war crimes investigation team. It, it's just been a joy to write. Um, can't wait for it to be out. And I'm really, really proud to be able to tell it. I'm all excited myself to read that one. It'll be it'll be a cracking read, and and it and it when when you, that little little excerpt you gave that little condensed version of it there just made me realise why on earth are Cohen people read these fiction spy books and fiction behind the line stuff when there was all these amazing real stories that are still uh, that are gripping, you know, and real, and you can actually un understand what real men went through. I, it's it's staggering. I mean, and do you think? I mean, it's a silly, quite loaded question, but are, are there going to be more stories? I mean, I'm sure there must be more in the archives. Obviously, you know where to find them now. So that there, there are enough untapped commando special forces missions to, 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 to generate a few more books, I hope. To last a lifetime. And the thing about it is you're <laughs> absolutely right. This is the great thing about it, right? <laughs> if you were writing fiction, you couldn't make these people up. Yeah. If you exactly. made up Gus March Phillips or mm. Blair Paddy Maine, yeah. or Captain Pat Garstan, who leads this patrol that I'm, I'm just talking about, or Appleyard, or Lassen, people yeah. would think, no, 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 those, those people don't exist. That's, that's too far-fetched. If you made up the missions they went on, people would say, no, 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 come on, that's, that's where Eagles Dare stuff. That's, that's yeah, fiction. Commando comics, yeah. If you made up the escape that happens in SAS Band of Brothers, you'd say, no, no, no. That, that, that. So not only are these stories absolutely gripping and dramatic and fast, fantastic and true, but no fiction writer could make up these characters on these kind of operations. That's the great thing about it. 
and I and I just want to say, you know, the, the books of yours I've read, I haven't read every single one, but I've read most of them. I like the fact as well, you also give that human angle of who these people are and what happened to them. They're not just characters in your novel. They are people you genuinely seem to care about. And when they get killed, you are upset as the as the as the writer. I can feel your sadness at their loss. And and therefore as the reader, I feel that as well, which um in fiction I don't get. So um I think well we've had a we had a great discussion and um um I'd love to have you back on again and do something about the SAS at some point that would be really cool if you'd like to come back um I'd happy to have you again Duncan you've given us some great insight into your uh, great uncle there so um anything else you want to say particularly about your what particularly recollections of your grand of your great uncle Duncan anything I just I just uh you know um I find that operation aquitant um to go down there like we do, we drive past the memorial most days when we're out there on the back on the battlefield. Um, we can work, uh, that is, yeah. Normal years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally. I just find it all very emotional. And um, you know, uh Damien, your your books, the attention to detail that you you, you put in your books are absolutely amazing. You know, you you sort of like sucked into the book when you read it. I mean, yeah, can't thank, thank you, you enough. Thank absolutely. you. Yeah, no, I mean. It's crucial to bring these characters alive. And, Absolutely. you know, and I get criticised in some quarters because people say you're not objective. You do care about your your protagonists, your characters. Well, unashamedly so. Yeah, Keep criticising me, you know, because that's how yeah. I tell stories. You know, this is yeah. about bringing history alive. And if we want to make this history relevant to younger generations coming up, we've got to make it real and visceral. And we've got to make these characters, you know, as exciting and vibrant and amazing as they were, you know. And yeah. that's what I try and do. Well, that's one of the reasons I do this YouTube channel, because I'm, I know there are some people who watch things like this who would never go and buy a book because they're just not book buyers. And if I can reach one or two more people and understand what their forefathers did via this media medium as opposed to books, then it's a good thing. And if they go on and read a book as well, then it's a win-win for everybody. So I'm going to bring things to an end now. So we haven't actually got a date for our Aquatint Part 3 yet. It'll be sometime probably early november now and we'll particularly talk about what happened to the men who who didn't get killed directly in aquatin but were disappeared into the french country so we've got some cracking stories coming up for you there we're hoping to have dr helen fry on talk about mi9 and their involvement in getting people back to england and also we've got a chateau in in normandy where one of the uh, survivors graham hayes went to and we're going to go there and film from the, the building he was in that'd be quite exciting i haven't got a date for it yet but we will get to that at some point in terms of housekeeping, as usual, if you have enjoyed this, please click the Patreon link and consider giving us a donation on a monthly basis. That'd be very nice. I've got nothing tomorrow. Friday evening, we've got our brilliant war films panel in our naffy natters, a bit more informal. We've got a couple of actors on, a director of photography, a couple of historians talking about our favorite war films. I won't tell you what my nominations are, but one is a very obscure one. Um, with David Hemmings in it. We'll talk about that on Friday. But come and then Saturday, we've got a live stream from Gold Beach with Ben Main about Vida Stone's Nest 35 and 35A, which Duncan will be out on the ground again, minus your tie that time. You'll be out in the rain again, Duncan. We'll send you out to do your proper job. So I've enjoyed it tonight. So hopefully people enjoyed it watching it. There's been some nice feedback on YouTube there about um, about it. So I know at least two of the people said they're going to buy your book. So that's a Another few pence in the coffers there, Damien. So that's good. So um, thank you very much for joining us, Damien. Thank you, Duncan. Um, I'm Paul Woodadge for World War II TV saying I'll see you all again soon. Um, and it's been an e interesting evening. Thank you very much for watching. Good night. Good night. Good night.